tape is a continuation of the previous message. Men have their problems, but women are cursed with a curse when they don't obey what the Scriptures say in submitting to their husbands. They're cursed with a curse. You can't get out from under it either. You can pray and fast and plead and beg until you correct your life. The curse will remain there. And, of course, the converse is true with husbands. They are cursed with a curse until they take over the headship. That's not a bad term. That's a biblical term, headship. Until they take over the headship of their family, over the wife and over the children. They're cursed with a curse. You can't do anything about the curse until you obey. And the curse leaves. Remember, Proverbs says the curse causeless does not come. In other words, there's a cause for every curse when it comes. You're probably reminded, as I am, of the account in Malachi 3 of the people who didn't do what they were supposed to in their giving. You're cursed with the curse. And you can't do anything about it, about the curse, until you obey. The same is true. The exact same thing is true here with the women, with the wives, with the men, with the husbands. Until biblical divine order, I would call the reverse of that or the absence of that chaos and disorder in the home. Until biblical divine order is restored. And there may still be some areas in your family where you just don't know that you're not in divine order. You might have uh, be approaching the right attitude, but there may be areas where divine order is still not there. Well, the blessings of God can't come. I mean, if the angels rebel against Christ, well, we see what happened when some did. He cast them down to outer darkness. Um, 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, to Tartaros, as the Greek says, deliver them to chains of everlasting darkness whenever the angels rebelled against Christ. And then if we want to say, well, and if Christ rebelled against the Father, well, that wouldn't be possible. He said, I always do the will of him that sent me. My meat, my food, John 4, 24, is to do, 4, 34, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He always did the Father's will. In other words, he was in a proper role. And so must we be as men and women, as Christian husbands and wives. And if we're not married, there's still a biblical role. Women are still women, whether you're married or not. And men should still be men, whether you're married or not. But this story of Rebecca and Isaac, I think, would shatter some of the false illusions of Christian women today. Of thinking, well, now I have to have my hand in, you know, every cake. I've got to have my hand in everything to make sure that it's done right. Well, you're not supposed to have your hand in things that are not part of your role. I would think women would be glad to hear this. They have enough to do without their husbands making them do their role too. My, I think women would rejoice over a teaching like this and the liberation that it brings. Praise God, I don't have to do that anymore then. It'd be like the business of cosmetics. You know, whenever you used to spend all the time in front of the mirror, probably two thoughts went through your mind. I like doing this because I want to be pretty, but I wish I didn't have to because it takes up so much time. Curling, you know, you have to get the curlers out. you got to remember how long to have them plugged in in advance before you go somewhere that night, or the curling iron has to be warmed up to flip the bangs back or under, whichever way they go, and the makeup and Praise God. I mean, yours truly has ridden in on a white horse, the Word of God, and delivered you from the two horns of that dilemma. I'd be rejoicing. Praise God. I don't have to waste my time doing things that not only I don't have to do, they're not expected of me, but God doesn't even want me doing them. I don't have to waste my time doing that anymore. I would think women would feel liberation in what the Bible has to say about their role, that they're not called to be the ones to think about everything and have everything all planned out and, I mean, actually almost be the foreman on the job so they get the belt on and the hammer and the nails and build their own house. That's not scriptural. She has enough to do at home, in the family, with the children. That is a full-time occupation. That's not part-time work as people try to make it out to be. Well, what does your wife do? Well, mine works at the factory. What is, well, mine just works part-time. She raises seven children. That's not part-time work. That's full-time work. That's a calling in itself. That's a role in itself. And guess what? We, men, are not fit to that. We're not suited to that. You can ask my wife. I'm not suited to that. And I'm not because I'm not and because I don't care to be. 
I'm good with the children. I love to spend time with them, but it's neither my calling nor my desire, and I don't have the ability to raise them and to be with them 12 hours a day. You see, I admire women who can do that. I'd lose my sanity being around three-year-olds 12 hours a day. Praise God. Can any other men say amen? Amen. (laughs) I'd lose my mind if I was there all day. And so women, they can't have that attitude because you've been given something that enables you to cope with it all day long. We don't have it. I know I don't have it. And I think I'm a gentle, tender, thoughtful person. But but when it comes to that, I know I just don't have it. And it's much safer just to go ahead and admit it and, and go ahead and live biblically. And don't get me wrong. You see, I'm willing to watch the children for a day if I have to. And I do that many times. But I mean, that's, that I can't do that full time because I don't get anything done. I don't see how you can do everything around the house while you watch children. I can watch them, but I can't get anything else done, though. I just sit there and stare at them the whole day. So you're probably better than I am. My mind is on elevated topics, you know. I want to go research something. And these guys are running around, you know, talking about spot jumped over the fence. And just, I'm not getting anywhere with this today. It's stunning my mind and stunning my growth here. <laughs> So that's why God gave me to be your teacher, some of you women, because I challenge your mind whenever you come here. Your kids stun it, and your pastor challenges it. I guess that's fair. (laughs) It gets stretched in both ways then. Well, you know, whenever we build our home, I'd venture to say, this may not happen, but I'd venture to say, my wife won't even see the place until the day we move in. And what do you think about a statement like that? I mean, most women in America, you mean he's going to play around with my kitchen? And I won't have any say-so. It's not that they don't have say-so, but it's not even her role. That's, you have enough things to think about. If I could just hammer home to people, men have certain roles. They don't, they don't have the capacity nor the calling to think about things that are not theirs. And the same is true with women. It's a great deliverance. You see, what we have in, in America today are people who are claiming to be titans who can hold two worlds on both of their shoulders, who can live the life of a man and the life of a woman at the same time. And this is not biblical. It is simply not biblical. I don't know what will happen with our home, but the point is, I don't want my wife, and she doesn't want her mind to be cluttered with all that goes on whenever you try to build a home. There's enough to do in building a home, and there's enough to do in raising the children. <laughs> We'll have to wait and see whether time fulfills this, but I would venture to say she probably won't see it until the day she moves in. Isn't that kind of like the biblical example of Isaac there? The husband has the place prepared, and it's all prepared. He just brings wifey home. says, here, Eve, here's your castle to reign over as the queen. I mean, that's what she is in the home. She's queen right under the king. Here's your castle. You didn't have to hammer any of the boards together. Here's your castle. If I was a woman, I'd... I'd be expected to carry over the, be carried over the threshold, too, into that new home. No, that has occult origins. First Samuel chapter 5. But maybe we can carry him over some other place in the home, as long as it's not over the threshold. <laughs> but you know, the woman, the typical woman of America, her attitude would be, you mean he's going to get his hands in my kitchen and my bedroom and... And I'm just sure it's going to be an utter mess. Well, you don't have, I don't have any interior decorating skills. I don't make any claims for that, but I'm not dumb. You don't have to have any skill. I mean, my study, I don't think, is ugly, and I'm responsible for arranging all of that. I like to think of it as a museum filled with books and relics down there. It's a decent place. I spend many hours down there. I think it's a very pretty place down there. I'm responsible for that. You don't have to have any skills. Just don't be an ignoramus. And I don't think most people are. I mean, I wouldn't want too little counter space or cupboard room or the layout in the kitchen to be so uh, broad and expansive that by the time you've worked a day, you've jogged five miles. You know how some are laid out as though no thought went into it all. The kitchen, you know, you've got one appliance on the other end of the room, 20 yards or 20 miles down the road there, and you have to walk from that all the way to the other. Well, common sense would tell you that. You put five miles on those two legs of yours at the end of the day in some ill-devised kitchens, I think. I wouldn't want the oven and the stove beside the refrigerator. 
I wouldn't want those three having their doors swinging out in the major passageway. Well, what else is there to think about then? Just common sense. Genesis 24, you even have a biblical passage for it. Isaac brought Rebecca home to a home she had never seen before. Well, let's get into a few concluding remarks in here then. And it's no, there's, there's no sense either, I might add, in checking my views out with others. <laughs> because it'll run cross grain to Hollywood and the sociologists and church members and let's don't forget the psychos, the psychologists. It'll run, that's a good name for them, psychos. It'll run cross grain to everything else. It won't do any good to check my views out, you know, and say, now what is his authority? Unless you want to check it out in the Word of God. And by the way, if you think, I think sometimes. And I, it just happens to be this way, and probably it has to be this way, that people maybe get the wrong impression. They think that I am a tyrant or something. We have a beautiful relationship in our home and family and marriage. I believe there's divine order there. I know there is. There's divine order. We, neither one of us were raised in it from childhood. We had to learn this after we had become Christian. And I think I, and it just happened this way, maybe it was the wife for you and your marriage, I think I was raised with more discipline than perhaps my wife was. She was just kind of, her parents just had kind of an attitude of, well, um, people will take care of themselves. You know, children just grow up. <laughs> they'll take care of themselves. Just let them alone and they'll turn out okay. No, that's not a good philosophy. It's not biblical philosophy. It says bring your child up in the way of the Lord and he won't depart from those ways whenever he's old. I had more discipline behind me whenever I was raised. So maybe it's been a little easier for me in our relationship than it has been for my wife. But be that as it may, I think there is divine order there. You wouldn't want to be too quick to criticize maybe what you think is divine order or what you think isn't divine order if you don't know what divine order is yourself. I've been in other homes. I've seen other relationships in and outside of this church. And sometimes it is terrible. It is horrifying. The way the wives control, the way they master and dominate things, or the way the husbands, and or I should say, the way the husbands just surrender everything, or the husbands are just so insensitive and unthinking, um, unthoughtful about everything around the home, with some of the examples I've given you before being just that good example, not thinking about the dishes, not thinking about clothes. So let me just mention a few things in, as we wind down here. I would list three uh, scenarios as being unbiblical ones that are typical where you find people in one or the other of these, and you may have found yourself here in the past. Number one would be this situation, one we've already been talking about, wives that dominate and or intimidate. Now, I threw in that second word for a purpose. Because if you left it with dominate, some wives would say, well, I don't dominate. Smile, smile, smile. They intimidate. They have little ways of intimidating. Now, as I say, you can't intimidate a man. You're married to a male. That's why he's intimidated. But they have ways of doing this. This is unbiblical. This obviously is an unbiblical position. Wives that dominate and or intimidate. Now, we're just giving you some of the um, some of the icing on the cake, I guess. We can't tonight. We can't go into all of what I might mean by that. But you're a Christian. You have the Holy Spirit. You observe your life and your attitude. You observe your home and your family. And you ask the Lord to show you what might be wrong there. There may be areas where you as a wife, or since we're talking to and about wives now, we'll get to the men here in a moment where you as a wife are still dominating, dominating. You're controlling, you're ruling, you run things. That's wrong. There will be a curse until that is corrected, or you intimidate in some way. I wish I could just sing all night the praises of our relationship and my wife because she is not that type of person. I think some women have maybe more... That's one blessing and benefit I got in the wife that I have is just something she was kind of born with and so I credit it still to God though that she is more of a submissive type I think some women are just the boisterous type just the controlling type I mean they find it very difficult to keep their mouth closed they just find it difficult to keep their mouth closed 
I think there are a lot of women who don't find it difficult to keep their mouth closed. It comes more or less natural to them if it was something due to just their upbringing or their past life or maybe something supernatural if it's due to the second birth, regeneration. There's some women who find it difficult to keep their finger out of every person's cake, to keep their mouth closed. Or, or I could say it like this. There are some who can keep their mouths closed, but they can't keep their minds stopped. They'll keep their mouth closed. And it's what we read here on page 122, an official legal nominal subjection submission to the husband. Well, I won't say anything, but you can see it in the eyes and you can see it in the mind. The mind is just running. Well, if I could speak, here's what I would say. And she just goes over and over all of her arguments and you're just killing yourself. That's a cancer in your own body. Just say, if he wants to do it this way, this is the way we're going to do it. I don't even, I'm not going to think about it. It's not my responsibility to think about it. If I were a woman, that's the way I would approach it if I ran into a situation like that because it alleviates all of the stress from the woman in her mind. That is a cancer in your body to be second-guessing your husband all the time. You wouldn't have even done that in olden days. See, that's the problem. Remember, don't get mad at me. You're birthed into this culture. Get mad at your parents. It's their fault, not mine, that you are birthed into this day and age. When things like this may sound harsh and hard to some. They're not. They're easy. It's the yoke of Jesus that's easy to follow. Yeah. The other way is the difficult, hard way. Yeah. But why shouldn't dominate or intimidate? Just lovingly submit. You don't have anything to lose by it. You have everything to gain. That would be Ephesians 5. If I gave you a scripture for that, it would be Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. Wives, obey your husbands in all things. In all things. That didn't say where you think that he's right, obey him. But in areas where you think you're right, you have the right to disobey, either in word or deed or thought. See, that's what I mean by saying tonight that we could go a lot deeper in this and maybe get into some areas that you haven't either thought about or you haven't crucified yet in your life. Wives, obey your husbands in all things as unto the Lord. All right, then here's a second unscriptural home. And I would describe these as disorder, not divine order. A second case of disorder would be the unbelievably weak. Someone talked about weakness tonight. The unbelievably weak males who are married today. And if you want to put a name beside both of these, then we would have under number one, the typical American scenario of a masculinized female, and under number two, the <coughs> feminized male. The unbelievably weak male that is married today. I've run into these, I've come across them, I've seen them, it is just pathetic. The weakness that is in their life. They have no more ability than a fence post to take control of the home and be an example. Not just, or not, <laughs> better strike that word just out, not a tyrant, but an example in the home. One who does make the decision. One who is worthy of the wife's respect. I mean, worthy not just because he's created a male but because he's willing to live as a man. He's worthy of it anyway, by the way, because he's a male. That's the way God has made him. But worthy because he's a man. Worthy of the respect and the obedience of the children. Now, if you'll turn over to um, uh, 1 Peter, we could look at all of these. I quoted most of these to you earlier. I just quoted the verse in Ephesians 5. But 1 Peter 3, I have one verse in mind here. Of course, we've got much teaching in this chapter, first seven verses. But uh, verses 3, or two verses, verses 3 and 5. 1 Peter 3, verses um, 1 Peter 3, verses 5 and 6. 5 and 6. But after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also... Now, he said this is true in old times. In other words, Peter was kind of arguing for the good old days, and he didn't seem to think that was an invalid argument. He said this is the way it used to be in olden times. 
with these holy women who hoped in God, adorned themselves, not with the outward adorning of verse 3, but adorned themselves, being in, and there's that old nasty term again, oh my, being in subjection, oh my, what a nasty term. That's an excedrin headache number 44 for a lot of women. Subjection, oh, I just see, I just see images in my mind of prison cells and chains and all types of medieval torture devices. Well, that's because the devil's working in your mind. That's not biblical subjection. Subjection is just obedience. Obey them. Lovingly submit and obey. Unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham. Now here's what I wanted to get to. Calling him Lord. Calling him Lord. What are we talking about here under number two? Unbelievably weak males who are married who don't hardly even deserve the respect of other people around, especially the wife, who sees him all the time and who can see very clearly he doesn't deserve any respect at all. Well, look at this man, Abraham, and this woman, Sarah. Abraham was a man who deserved respect. I mean, he earned it. He was worthy of respect and subjection and submission. And Sarah obeys him, calling him Lord. I think, I mean, you have to check your own thermometer as you go over passages like this. You get funny feelings. Do you think that I'm preaching to you? Well, I am, by the way. That's why we're here tonight, aren't we? So if I, you think I'm preaching to you, you're exactly right. But, I mean, do you get those funny, uncomfortable feelings when you read over a scripture like this? And that means that's always a sign that you need to deal with something. It's always a sign. When you read over that scripture, just so you can say that you've read it. When you read that verse, just so you can get to, you know, verse 10. That it's just a bridge to get to what you're really wanting to read in that chapter. Because the verses, meanwhile, make you very uncomfortable. Reminds me of a story I heard. But let me tell you another story tonight, a short one this time, where two Christians were together doing some Bible study. One was a new convert, one was an old stalwart of the faith. The new convert turned to the old stalwart of the faith and said, you know, he said, the passages of Scripture that bother me are those that I can't seem to understand. The old stalwart of the faith turned to him and said, Oh, is that so? He said, The passages that bother me are those that I can't understand. <laughs> well, how often that is true in people's lives. Those are really the ones that bother us, not the ones we can't understand. It's not something in Revelation that really bothers you. What really bothers you, <laughs> if anything does, in God's Word, are those texts that you do understand. At least the fellow was being honest there, which showed he wasn't such a stalwart in the faith after all. But that shows he was being honest. Oh, he said, is that so? The ones that bother me are those texts that I do understand. In other words, I know what they're saying, and I'm either not and or not willing to obey them and do them. Well, that's always a sign that this is the passage that the Holy Spirit has for you that day or that week or that month or that year it may take you. It's a long time. It takes a long time to really learn the examples. But verse 6, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I mean, that was true in the olden days. Women looked up to their husbands. They were lords to them. And he says that even in light of what he's going to go on to say, if you are thinking of verse 7, what he's going to go on to say in verse 7, under this phrase, being heirs together of the grace of life. I know that's there. I've got the verses memorized here. I know that's there. But he, and so maybe that's what makes verse 6 stand out even more so to me. Because he goes on to talk about them being heirs together of the grace of life. And yet he starts earlier by saying, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. In olden days, that's the way that it was. In olden days, women didn't talk, didn't just open their mouths and blab in the company of other men. In olden days, women didn't stand out in the front with their hairdo and trying to get all the attention. They stood behind their husband. You can watch couples. I can guarantee this. You'll watch them. You'll see whether there's divine order or disorder. Watch the way they stand. You'll see the typical American family, the father's way at the back, and the old wife, Eve, dominant, sinful Eve, is right there in the very front, make sure everyone can see her, and so she can do the loudest and the most talking. That's true. Most of the time, if it's a biblical family, 
you'll find the wife is somewhere behind the husband. He's standing out and she's behind his shoulder. And think of the imagery that's expressed. That's the way that it should be. She should be behind him. Behind him in all of his decisions. She's behind what he's doing and where he's going and what he's saying. And she's behind him in her role as a female and as a woman, especially in the kingdom of God. I heard a tape a few months ago by a well-known radio preacher. I'll just say this. His first name is Chuck, and his last name reminds you of a thief. That's all I'm going to say about it. (laughs) And he said this. Now, he thought this was something to boast about. Listen to this statement. I don't know, he said it's real, and I put him under this second category right here. I don't know how my wife has been able to put up with me these last 35 years of our marriage. That's supposed to be such a kind, thoughtful thing that, oh, I'm such a bad husband, and I've got so many faults, and I don't put my dirty clothes in the dirty hamper, and I don't turn them right side out, and I don't even know how my wife's been able to pat her on the back. I don't know how she's been able to put up with me for the last 35 years. You wouldn't find a statement like that said back in patriarchal days. You wouldn't find Abraham saying that to Sarah. We find just the reverse here. A little small thing like that. My ears just catch that and about knocks me off the chair when I listen to that. I think that is going out to thousands of other Christians influencing the way they think. That's a neat, what men think is that's a neat, chivalristic, um, self-effacing way to give glory and honor to your wife. Say, I don't know how she's been able to put up with me for these 35 years. And I'm not saying it should be reversed and, and she should say that of the man, but I'm just saying neither one should be said. That's not a statement that should be made. I know what the thought behind it is. It's supposed to be a kind, self-giving, self-sacrificial type of thought behind it, but it's not biblical, though. It's just not a biblical way to express it. I may sound like I'm nitpicking or buttonholing here, but that's just the way that it is. That sounds real cute in America. But you would not have heard something like that in patriarchal days where a king says, well, I'm glad with the old queenie here has put up with me and all my sloppy ways all these years. Man, if she would have disobeyed him as we read in Esther, he'd banish her to the dungeon is what he would do to her. Never heard in patriarchal homes. And the Bible is a patriarchal book. Although we today are living in a matriarchal society. My files are choked full of reports by the psychos of what's happened in America. We live in a matriarchal society. And you can think of it like this. I mean, children are raised around women all the time. They see women at school. They're their teachers. They see women at the library. They're the librarians. They see women as clerks. They see women everywhere. Women are in everything. In anything that influences a child, you'll always find, generally you'll find a woman there in that role, in that position, instead of a man. And so what do all the children grow up thinking? Well, the girls grow up emulating those women, a strong, independent woman, and the boys grow up to be males who have been um, emasculated, quote-unquote, use it as a metaphor, by the strong influence of women around them all their life. That's an awfully important thought to think of. And the psychos, the unchristian psychos, have done reports on that, that something in that whole ethos has damaged the children that are, say, post-war babies. Baby, uh, war, children, you know, the baby boom generation. Children ever since then, children up until today, are being raised under the same culture and same ethos. And it's damaging to them. I'll give you another biblical reference here in a moment. So, here's the second type of home that you'd want to avoid. The unbelievably weak male. I wish I could say more and teach on this. Praise the Lord. We'll just have to save it for later. You don't have a lot. It's too bad, but you don't have a lot of good examples around you. So you can say, well, I'm just going to be like them. You have to search with Jerusalem, search Jerusalem with a lamp to find a few men, a few men who are not weak. They're good men, but they don't play to women. It's just not even a thought of theirs to play to women and to always have to be coddling them. Along, You know, the politicians do that. That's what I started to say earlier when I talked about the automobile industry, that they're having to play to women now. Politicians do it. They're realizing that after, you know, so-called women's suffrage, with women having the right to vote now, they are a large people out there in American society. And so what do you do? You play to women. You can't say anything derogatory about women or talk as though you are are a male-oriented type politician. Man, 
Those women would close up, votes on you so fast, you'd be back collecting trash at the local dump rather than running for mayor or city council or something. They'd close those votes up on you so fast you wouldn't know what hit you. And so I'm saying we're just being bombarded by that influence all the time. Women who dominate and intimidate and men who like to have it so. Men who've been forced into this role and who seem to kind of like the role. And maybe we can even borrow a little of antichrist Freudian psychology here that a lot of men like to marry their mother. They want someone to coddle them and mother them and oh, chum, 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 and take care of them. Instead of kicking them out of the house, get out of here, Adam. Go out and be a man in the world today. They like, they want to marry their mother. Someone who tuck the covers, pull them under and tuck the covers and that's wrong. That's a sick mentality to have. You're not supposed to marry your mother. That's why I call them males. They're boys, not men. And then here's the third, the third category. Some of you women maybe were waiting for me to get to this one. The unbelievably selfish or insensitive husbands. See, we are arguing the biblical argument of divine order, headship in the home, where the man, the father, the husband is the head, the wife, and he's strong, not weak. The wife does not dominate or intimidate. She is a follower, not a leader. She is a follower. That's the way she's made. For the continuation. The wife, and he's strong, not weak. The wife does not dominate or intimidate. She is a follower, not a leader. She is a follower. That's the way she's made. She follows him. But then what if we have the case where the woman is willing to follow but she has a husband who is unbelievably unthoughtful, uh, selfish, insensitive to her and to her needs and desires. Well, now you've got a double whammy, as they say, of a problem. Because um, the woman's still got a role. She's still bound to her role, scripturally. Uh, whether the husband performs his or not. You say you can't help someone perform theirs or perform half of it for them, but... She's got a double problem now because she doesn't have a husband who will really lead, but she does have one who, when he does or says anything, is selfish, unthoughtful, and insensitive. And so I truly hope most places where I've ever taught you know, on this besides this church, I've never had enough time. People haven't given me enough time. I've been shouted down before I finish to you know, develop what the Bible is saying. But I truly hope here that you wouldn't read between the lines and think you see something that's not being said in what I'm saying. That when I argue for biblical divine order and male headship in the home, I'm not talking about turning the husband into an unthinking, insensitive, selfish, cruel tyrant. And well, it's your lot in life as a woman just to hang your head and follow him right off the gangplank to the sharks below. I mean, I would hope that in a Christian church, in a Christian environment, that if you've got a husband or if you had a husband like that, that he is growing out of selfishness and insensitivity. That's not biblical. Divine headship isn't, see how cruel you can be as a husband, which will prove you're not weak, you're strong after all. That's not the biblical, that's not what Paul is saying in these passages here. And that's not what I'm saying. I would argue, because Ephesians 5 argues otherwise, I would argue for a unselfish, sensitive, thoughtful husband who's also strong. He doesn't play to women, but he's sensitive to his wife's needs and to her personality and to her thoughts and to her desires. He's sensitive to that. He is not selfish. He is not unthinking in his approach to her and her life. Now, not all men are like this. Some men, you can get them to receive this biblical teaching because they have some of the vestigial remains of the Cro-Magnon syndrome. They love to beat and drag by the hair of their wife around. But to be sensitive toward them, that's beyond their little uh, third grade spiritual capabilities. Well, then you, you're missing the, the forest because of the trees now. Because really you're not being the biblical head and leader in the home just because you can dominate. That's not enough. Because what do we have in Ephesians 5? 
We've got women, wives, obey your husbands and everything. But then that's not the end of the story. There's a flip side to that coin. Husbands, love your wives. Now, I admit, sometimes in this type of teaching, where the teaching is geared toward biblical headship, divine order, sometimes this is lacking. Maybe that's what's given a bad name, although I don't think so. I just think it's the devil trying to create disorder in the midst of divine order, and God's creative order here. But that which is given a, a negative name, an evil name, to this whole biblical approach to men and to women. So Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So we would certainly argue in favor of that. Husbands should be sensitive and thoughtful to the needs and to the desires of their wife. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you in your married life sat down and, as I'm talking to men, sat down and wept for joy and for love over the spouse God has given you? Well, you don't have to volunteer an answer out loud. You can raise your hand in your heart. I mean, that would show what true love you have for her. How many times in the last year? I mean, you could bring flowers or bring a box of candy, and that might not have any meaning to it. That's just kind of the typical thing to do. If you want to do that, fine. I, I, I'm not one who does that, because candy makes you fat, fat and flowers fade and wilt as soon as you bring them home. If I'm going to bring something home, I'm going to bring home something worthwhile and meaningful than a big old box of fat-producing chocolates you want to buy the box of chocolates, buy them for me. It won't hurt me. I'll let her buy those for me. I don't think I've ever brought home. I never have brought home a box of chocolates. Russell Stover candy is what you're supposed to bring home. I may have brought home flowers once or twice, but it has been the exception and not the rule. I don't care. If you want to bring home flowers, go right ahead. I don't have a big problem with that. If I bring something, I try to buy something that she needs around the house. You get a lot more good out of that than some flowers... <laughs> will the next day <laughs> or that calls her to have to spend extra time to water them and keep them alive all the time you just took up her next day the time she was going to read by caring for those <coughs> wilting flowers but how many times in the last year have you wept for joy because of the spouse god has given you i mean that that will show it could show that you're weak but it could show if you're already strong in your life that you're strong and you have the Ephesians 5 also that you love, you nourish, you cherish your wife. Well, I won't brag on myself, but I wouldn't be giving you that as a test if I, don't, if I didn't think I could pass it or if I hadn't already passed it myself. I mean, I love my wife. I do sit sometimes and I just, I just say, thank you, God in heaven. I, you couldn't, I couldn't have chosen anyone better than this. So you have to have the right attitude in your own heart as a man. I don't have any desires to be cruel to my wife, but I am going to do this. I'm going to be the head of the home whether anybody likes it in the home and they happen to like it. But even if they didn't, I want to do that anyway because that's biblical and that's scriptural. I just would hope that everyone in the family will eventually get into their role and everyone will have those loving attitudes toward each other. Now let me just close by jumping over to Leviticus. Look at some rather perverse verses in Leviticus chapters 20 and 18. Something that I've long thought about many years ago. And I don't think I've ever used these scriptures in this light before, but I'm going to use them now. Leviticus 20 and verse 12 and Leviticus 18 and verse 23. I just want to try to give you a biblical picture of what happens if you don't obey what you've heard from God's word tonight. Leviticus 20 and verse 12. These have always been interesting verses to me, just because of the way that they're worded. If a man lie with his daughter-in-law, sorry that they're kind of perverse verses, but I have to use them because of what they say. Both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood should be upon them. Other translations like the NIV might say perversion. It's the same thing. You know, confusion is something's out of order. Perversion is something's been done backwards. All right, look at Leviticus 18:23. Really, you can just take B, 23B. Neither shall a woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. Bestiality here. 
a horrible, perverse sin that you hardly even want to think about. But if any woman will stand before a beast to lie down and have relations with the beast, look at the conclusion, the same as in chapter 20, it is confusion. Do you know what he's saying there? What he's saying is everything it becomes totally out of order then. You have, you have um, struck at the very root of the created order. It is absolute, utter perversion and confusion when this happens. And when it happens, the confusion that enters into the world colors everything else that's in the world. Think whenever these sins do take place, men sleep with their daughter-in-law, their son's wife. That is utter wickedness and perversion of the nth degree. And lower than that is this horrible, sordid case in Leviticus 18.23b. And I just have always found the conclusion to these sins to be interesting. It is confusion. Just think of all of the of the images that come to your mind with that word. It is confusion. Beasts were made for beasts. Women were made for men. A woman and a beast, you have so perverted God's intended plan, you have wrought perversion and confusion into God's universe. Now, the point is, the exact same thing is true. The exact same thing could be said when women get out of their roles and men get out of their roles. That is so foundational to the universe and to human existence and experience that when you get out of those roles, you have raw perversion and confusion. That's a weighty thought I want to leave you with tonight. These aren't just my own pet thoughts or something. I'm not teaching you this because I was raised this way. I was raised in the same liberal generation you were. But I've gotten this out of God's Word, the Holy Scriptures. That when you get out of those roles, when men are weak and vacillating and compromising and effeminate, you have wrought confusion in God's plan. Men were not made to be that way. And just think of the way a man is made. As he gets older, his skin is not like his wife's. He grows hair on his face. He is rough. I mean, just his, even his physical makeup is different than a woman, which speaks of hardness compared to the softness of a woman. And then, of course, all women want the skin of their newborn babies because it's so soft and luscious and precious. Whenever a woman dominates and intimidates, she has wrought utter confusion. Whenever a husband, and this wouldn't so much apply to this third thing that I've given you tonight, but when a husband is insensitive, you also are going to, as they say, wreak havoc in the home. But I don't think that these two verses would apply as much to that third point as to the first two, because the first two talk about people out of their role. The feminized male, the masculinized female. When that is the case, even in small areas, you have brought confusion. I mean, that's all he can say about it. You have brought, con- it is confusion. You can't make sense of things anymore then. When you have these perverse sexual relationships, you can't make sense of anything. Nothing makes sense anymore. What is man after all? Man, generic mankind. What is a woman after all if she sleeps with an animal? Um, you, you have lost, life has lost its meaningfulness then. You have so twisted the created order that nothing makes sense anymore. What are people after all? They'd be nothing more than a beast. They're nothing but just matter. Um, in, sensitive, carnal matter like a tree or a rock or a stone or the atoms that make up the flesh of some dog or a horse or a cow. Think what confusion and what perversion enters into the created order when something like this happens. Well, we're saying that because the biblical roles are foundational in the creative order as expressed in the creation chapters, Genesis 1-3, to that when those are tampered with, they're being tampered with today by the world. We, we shouldn't be surprised. They're being tampered with by the church today. When those are tampered with, it's like feeding the wrong information into a computer. It's just reject. Nothing makes sense anymore. Nothing can be accomplished anymore. The program shuts down. The business stops. Life stops then. When we tamper with these foundational elements to the created order, men must be men and women must be women. Well, let's just read a few concluding sentences here in C.S. Lewis' Screwtape Letters, and I'll be through tonight. 
I left you with this sentence, three quarters of the way down, page 122. Later on, you can venture on what may be called the generous conflict illusion. This game is best played with more than two players in a family with grown-up children, for example. He's just giving an example of what we've already taught on. Something quite trivial, like having tea in the garden, is proposed. One member takes care to make it quite clear, though not in so many words, that he would rather not, but is, of course, prepared to do so out of unselfishness. Well, the others instantly withdraw their proposal, ostensibly through their unselfishness, but really because they don't want to be used as a sort of lay figure on which the first speaker practices petty altruisms. It's back to the, well, you do it well, no, you can have it well, that's in there. But he is not going to be done out of his debauch of unselfishness either. He insists on doing what the others want. They insist on doing what he wants. Passions are aroused. Soon someone is saying, very well then, I won't have tea at all. And a real quarrel ensues with bitter resentment on both sides. You see how it is done? If each side had been frankly contending for its own real wish, which my wife and I were doing with the den furniture, they would all have kept within the bounds of reason and courtesy. But just because the contention is reversed and each side is fighting the other side's battle, all the bitterness which really flows from thwarted self-righteousness and obstinacy and from the accumulated grudges of the last ten years is concealed from them by the nominal or official unselfishness of what they are doing, or at least held to be excused by it. Each side is indeed quite alive to the cheap quality of the adversary's unselfishness. Have you ever entered this type of situation before? I hope you know what he's talking about here, where you're willing to back down for someone else and know. It's, I guess the best example is whenever you walk to a door and there are two people and you get there about the same time. One tries to grab it. No, I'll hold it for you. No, I'll hold it for you. And pretty soon you're both, I said, I'll hold it for you. And you're wanting to fight over your love for him. And he said, that's the problem here. He said, rather than them both saying, I'm not going to open the door. You're going to have to open it. At least they are frank and honest about the matter than hiding under this false pretense of unselfishness. A sensible human once said, if people knew how much ill-feeling unselfishness occasions, it would not be so often recommended from the pulpit. And again, she's the sort of woman who lives for others. You can always tell the others by her haunted expression. <laughs> All of this can be begun even in the period of courtship. A little real selfishness on your patient's part is often of less value in the long run. Selfishness. He said that's of less value to us than unselfishness for securing his soul in the first beginnings of that elaborate and self-conscious unselfishness which may one day blossom into the sort of thing I have described. Some degree of mutual falseness, some surprise that the girl does not always notice just how unselfish she is being, can be smuggled in already. Cherish these things, and above all, don't let the young fools notice them. If they notice them, they will be on the road to discovering that love, quote-unquote, is not enough, that charity is needed, and not yet achieved, and that no external law can supply its place. His last thought, I wish Slim Slum Trimpet could do something about undermining that young woman's sense of the ridiculous. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.
maybe to leave us with tonight I still feel impressed that there's so much more that could be said about this Um, I think it's such a spiritual area that you need to meditate on this and ask the Lord for revelation and for guidance in your life you will not find you will not get this teaching anywhere else Uh, you can just write that down you won't find this anywhere else you find a little bit of teaching in some circles on male headship, but they always water it down and you end up all the men end up playing to the women after all. And I'm telling you, it's not because this is my opinion or my view. It's it's God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. God's looking down from heaven at homes, looking at the order. What do we have in 1 Corinthians 11? But the angels are looking in the assembly to see if women have head coverings on. I mean, we could really take off on a thought like that and develop that. What are they looking for? They're looking for divine order. That's in the context, 1 Corinthians 11, of the headship passage there, of all things. They're looking in the church. And what do you think is their attitude when they look and behold, there's a woman pastoring the church? Those angels say, hey, we're just going to turn this church over to the demons and there's nothing we can do here. I mean... Not only do the women not have head coverings on, they don't believe in that. That's a sign of submission. And it's exactly what it is. It's a sign of submission. Not only do the women not have head coverings on, that'd be bad enough. But a woman is pastoring the church. A woman is music leader. A woman is associate pastor. A woman is building committee chairman. It's humorous, but it's a serious matter. That's the Word of God, 1 Corinthians 11. The, the angels look down to see the order to see where the divine order is in the church. The church is divine order there. I mean, the implication is the angels are bound. They cannot minister if there's disorder rather than divine order in the assembly of God. That's the household of God. The household of the family goes back much earlier in history. That's before the church. That's Genesis chapters 1 through 3. And surely the angels as well as God himself also look down into the home to find out, is there divine order? You wonder what some of your problems are in your life, your body, your marriage, your mind. Well, there could be many reasons, but I'm telling you one of them now. Disorder in the home will bring a curse on your family, on your home, on your life. I don't know in what area. It'll bring a curse to you. You can be guaranteed of that. Disorder in the home. It's crucially important. You won't get this teaching anywhere. You won't find any any other men, unless they're just boastful braggarts and they're unsaved people, you won't find any men who are truly biblical men. They're always weak, effeminate, little hushed, sophomore voice type playing to women pansies because that's the way they've been raised. To find someone who is strong and who doesn't play into the clutches of women is a rare, rare thing. So God has given us something to think about and something to meditate on here. That is very, very important for our church. You can't bring this family disorder into the divine order of the assembly of God. Because then what you'll have is, well, disorder in the household of God. Like you've got disorder in the household at home. It's a touchy subject. And probably that's why it's touched on so often in Scripture. Over and over and over again. The Lord has a lot to show us. Women learn to be women. And you won't, like I say, don't check me out with some, some other authority somewhere. You won't, because you'll find just the opposite. And you look at the women around you as you're out in the world, and I mean, they'll browbeat you in a hurry if you try to be a scriptural woman. Well, my husband takes care of that in a quiet, soft voice. He does what? Man, Alfred Knickerbocker III, my husband, I don't let him get off the couch until I tell him he can get up and go. I give him an allowance. That's the way women are. That is a shame. That is confusion and perversion in the created order. So men, be in this church, in your homes, be men. Be strong. Be, be tender and sympathetic and thoughtful and sensitive, but be strong nonetheless. You know, Jesus loves the church, but he's the church's Lord before he's the church's love. 
A lot of people go to that Ephesians 5. Well, it says Jesus loves and nourishes and cherishes. So they use that men do, or women to men, to water down the man. Well, he is the church's Lord before he is the church's love. You must make him Lord first before you'll ever be his love or he'll be your love. In other words, his role comes first. He is Lord, God, and King before he becomes friend and buddy or whatever you want to try to make him to be. The same is true with headship in the home. So men be men, women be women, be gentle, be meek, be quiet. Let your good works speak for you, not your flashy clothes or not your mouth. Let your good works and your gentleness. You read in Proverbs 31, in her tongue was the law of kindness. You don't find that in a lot of women. They have what we call an acid tongue, poisoned by the serpent below. In her tongue was the law of gentleness, meekness, quietness. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless that word to your heart then. Amen. Amen.